Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Justin Brown, the Executive Director for the Center for LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, at the CUNY Graduate Center. I want to welcome all of you tonight to our final roundtable in our series, Queer Then and Now. CLAGS Kessler Award winners reflect on queer, trans activism and scholarship. This evening, it is wonderful to see and welcome back Roderick Ferguson, Yasbir Poir, and Susan Stryker. As many of you know, the Center for LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, was started in the home of our founding director, Martin Duberman, nearly 35 years ago. Since its inception, CLAGS has evolved but stayed true to its mission of raising the voices of our community, addressing the needs and concerns of our community, providing spaces for the scholarship leading to social change, and standing with our extended families and other communities to fight for social justice. We call out the history of oppression, discrimination, and violence within this country, and the existence of a society that today has allowed for a continued rhetoric of white supremacy and senseless, abhorrent acts of anti-Asian violence. We stand up and speak out against the white straight hegemony that is this country. With this in mind, we take this opportunity to acknowledge the Lenape, the indigenous people's land for whom many of us currently sit on, where our center is situated on, whose land was stolen from them by European colonizers. We as an organization know that we have much to do, but know that we are committed to this reconciliation work. Without further ado, I pass along to our board co-chair, Debanush Dasgupta. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Debanuj, Debanuj Dasgupta. I am Assistant Professor of Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Today, I am uh, welcoming everybody from Kolkata, India. It's actually my last event that I'm doing while I was on a trip to India. And I'm wearing a Paisley chocolate sari with chunky Indian jewelry. So I want to welcome everybody. Uh, and as board co-chair, one of my responsibilities is to help raise money for CLAGS. And um, today I wanted to speak about the three major areas where our work is. First, I wanted to say that this is the 35th year of plagues um, and for the last 35 years we have been keeping open the space for queer trans theory queer trans studies and students in one of the largest university public university systems and urban public university systems in the country um, and as you know plagues um, and cuny services, mostly first generation immigrant students of color, and our work is crucial in this political conjuncture. So the three pronged approach of CLADS, like today, our events are for free and open to the public. And throughout the year, we have a range of events. And uh, in fact, during the pandemic, we have been very active over the webinars. We work, the second area of our work is scholarships and fellowships. We provide scholarships and fellowships to CUNY students, emerging scholars, established scholars, like the Kessler Awardees today, to emerging scholars in transgender studies, um, and to uh, for projects, for visual and artistic projects. 
The third area of work that CLAGS is engaging in currently and it's growing is to work within the city university system, within all the campuses and colleges to promote LGBTQ studies, collaborate with campus faculty, um, organize transgender town halls, supporting trans students and scholarship. So in this context, I'm going to ask you that, to give us money and you will see the support flags with the donation button in the chat. At the last Kessler event, we raised $3,800. I'm hoping we can double the money and I will tell you why. You should give us money. The Kessler is an endowed award, but most of our awards are not endowed. One of the endowed award that we lost in the previous three years was the Robert Gerard Fellowship. This was an art, this was an award given to a portrait, landscape, or a figure photographer or, or a visual artist. And we have lost this fellowship as well as funds for the Passing the Torch Award, which was an award um, recognizing the achievements and promise of an emerging scholar. And at one time, this award went to scholars such as Robert McCrewer, Robert Breed Farr, many of whom are legendary scholars of their own right now. So if you click on that button, you can give 35, 350, 380, or 3,800 and help me match my goal for 3,800 or double it for today. So help support our work, click on the donate button and, you're, and I'll give you an update throughout the event as to how much we are raising if you're moving towards our goal. Thank you so much for listening to me. With that, I want to pass on um, to Margot Weiss, my co-board, my board, a member with whom we have conspired this event. Margo, Joseph, Donica, and I have been working on this together. Margo, without further ado. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited and thrilled to be here. Um, I'm Margo Weiss, Associate Professor of American Studies and Anthropology, Coordinator of Queer Studies at Wesleyan University. And as Devanush just said, I had the pleasure of organizing this panel series with Devanush and Joseph Donica as part of the CLAG's 30th, 35th, depending on how you reckon it, birthday celebrations. A brief visual description. I'm a white woman with pinned up brown hair, red cat eye glasses. I'm wearing a black shirt with a red stone. No, I changed it. A another necklace. I think I'm wearing a red stone necklace in my image though. Um, tech detail. This event has embedded cart captioning. And in the case of any technical issues, there's a backup link for captioning. And I think it's in the chat. Um, everyone should see that. And I also wanted to mention that tonight's roundtable is sponsored by CLAGS and co-sponsored by the Feminist Futures Initiative at UC Santa Barbara. So thank you very much um, to our sponsors. Uh, tonight is the second roundtable in our spring series, Queer Then and Now. CLAGS Kessler Award winners reflect on queer and trans activism and scholarship. If you missed the first one last month, which featured Kessler Award winners Amber Hollibaugh, Dean Spade, and Urvashi Vad in conversation with CLAG's board member Shante Paradigm Smalls, you can watch it on our YouTube, and I think the link is in the chat. Uh, we've conceived these roundtables to reflect on CLAG's amazing history supporting cutting edge queer and trans scholarship and activism over these past 35 years. CLAGS has been giving the Kessler Award for Lifetime Achievement in LGBTQ Studies since 1992. Endowed by David R. Kessler, the lecture series is the first of its kind at an academic institution, and it's CLAGS's most prestigious honor, recognizing a scholar whose career contributions and body of work have left an indelible mark on the interdisciplinary fields of queer and trans studies. Past honorees include Judith Butler, Samuel Delaney, Eve Sedgwick, Barbara Smith, Kathy Cohen, Sarah Ahmed, and of course the scholars here tonight. You can see the full list of awardees on our website and many of the lectures are available on our YouTube. 
and those links are in the chat. The first 10 years of Kessler lectures were published in 2003 as the volume Queer Ideas. And I think I can share the news with you that we have just signed a contract with the Feminist Press to publish a second volume of selected Kessler lectures from 2000 to today. So look forward to that. For tonight, when we thought about who we'd want to hear discuss histories and new directions in queer and trans scholarship and activist scholarship, we, of course, thought of our three distinguished panelists, Roderick Ferguson, Jasbir Poir, and Susan Stryker, who will be in conversation with CLAG's board member, Shaka McLaughlin. I'm going to introduce them briefly, and we'll also put their bios in the chat. Awarded the Kessler just last year for his contributions to queer of color critique, a phrase he coined in his 2004 book, Aberrations in Black, Roderick Ferguson is professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Yale University. Rod's scholarship reveals the necessity of a political economic critique that centers intersections of race, class, gender, and sexuality. His books and edited collections, including One Dimensional Queer, we Demand, The Reorder of Things, The University and Its Pedagogies of Minority Difference, and Strange Affinities showcase his essential critique of canonical epistemologies and the politics of knowledge production, a signal intervention in queer studies, as well as sociology, university studies, American studies, and African American studies. Susan Stryker was awarded the Kessler in 2008 in recognition of her field creating and defining work in trans studies. Currently the Barbara Lee Professor in Women's Leadership at Mills College, Susan is a groundbreaking trans theorist. From editing the first special issue on transgender studies in GLQ in 1998, to her Emmy award-winning film, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria, to the 2006 publication of the foundational Transgender Studies Reader, to her books, Transgender History, Gay by the Bay, Queer Pulp, to founding the new journal TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly in 2014. Over her career, Susan has made critical contributions to documenting, archiving, and uplifting trans history in both academic and community settings. Awarded the Kessler in 2019, Jasper K. Poir is Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. Her first book, 2007's Terrorist Assemblages, coined the phrase homonationalism, setting forth a challenge to queer studies to reconsider alignments between sexuality and militarism, war, the nation state, diaspora, and settler colonialism. Her second book, The Right to Name, brought this biopolitical critique deeper into disability studies, while her edited collections, including the brand new hot left of queer, have cemented her reputation as a trenchant critic of both queer and American exceptionalism and the global expansion of empire from Guantanamo to occupied Palestine. Jasper is also recognized as a fearless scholar activist. And finally, before I turn it over to Shaka, I want to introduce and thank them for moderating this conversation tonight. Shaka McLaughlin, CLAG's board member, is an anthropologist and maker who stages encounters between Black study, queer theory, media, and art. Professor of Media Studies and Anthropology at Purchase College, SUNY, Shaka also serves as chair of the Gender Studies and Global Black Studies programs. Their books and edited volumes include Virtual Intimacies, Black Genders and Sexualities, Zombies and Sexuality, and the almost out brand new Dragging in the Drag of a Queer Life. So, Let's welcome our amazing speakers. And without further ado, Shaka, take it away. Hi, all. Um, <clears throat> thanks so much to everyone who made this possible, to all the attendees, and to um, all the other members of the, of the board. Uh, it's my huge honor to be able to facilitate this, um, this part of the night. So basically the way it's gonna work is this, the panelists have been invited to speak for about eight minutes each. And then after we'll have a couple of, um, a couple of questions. Um, I do want to, I did prepare something else, um, but I'm not gonna get into all of it, just to say to the, to the guests, um, Susan, Rod and Jasbir, you've been 
um, I could not, I couldn't think the way that I think without each of your work. I remember um, where, when and where I read it exactly. And I was gonna take photos of like the pages and like aberrations in black uh, and, and terrorist assemblages and queer pulp uh, and send them, but maybe that's for another day. So um, with that, I'm very pleased to introduce the panelists, um, Roderick Ferguson, Jasbir Poir, and Susan Stryker. Um, I think the protocol, right, would be y'all can put your cameras on. There we go. <laughs> All, all squared away, Jasmir. You know, what's funny is I didn't come on super early and um, exactly what happened to you started happening to me. And yeah, so glad you're here. Um, then we have, uh, sorry, my view is a little bit funny here. There we go, all of us are on there. Okay, so um, the order that I thought we could do, if there's no particular uh, preferences, would be um, Rod, Susan, and Jasbir, if you could each speak for that about eight minutes. And then afterwards, um, we will have a little conversation. Okay, so I guess that means I go, right? Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here, um, especially with uh, Shaka, Jasbir, and Susan. Um, let's see, then and now, queer studies and trans studies, scholarship and activism. Um, the way I tend to date things, and I'm not sure why, but for some reason, that volume, uh, What's Queer About Queer Studies Now, from 2005, um, has been a kind of marker for me. And for folks who don't know the volume, this is a special issue of social text that was put together um, by Jose Munoz, David Eng, and uh, Jack Halberstam. And it was trying to assess what was then you know, sort of emergent formations uh, within uh, queer studies, uh, moving um, not away, but extending and perhaps moving away from uh, primarily literary critiques, you know, within queer studies, but also trying to um, highlight work that was uh, using queer studies to intersect with histories of racial capitalism, colonialism, militar militarization, um, empire, migration. And, you know, at the time, you know, it was, you know, it was a very exciting moment. I don't know that we thought that it would, you know, take off the way it has in this moment um, so that what was emergent in that moment has in many ways become uh, the convention, you know, within uh, queer studies. Uh, one of the things that has been really heartening for me, in addition to the scholarship that's emerged from that, is also the organizing that um, has accompanied that emergence and also has uh, you know, sort of uh, used those texts that work, you know, to inform activism at this moment. You know, so for instance, the Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, protests where it is uh, part of, you know, an a priori assumption that uh, that movement arises out of and is connected to feminist and queer and trans uh, conversations, work, uh, activism, existing and prior, you know, the ways in which we are seeing the kinds of um, fluencies around empire, intersectionality, um, you know, around militarization and wars in Asia as a way to assess the gendered violence that occasion, uh, the massacres in Atlanta. And so I really think for me, this, this is an exciting moment in which uh, the scholarship that people have been doing, which was always sort of uh, working hand in hand with uh, 
queer, queer of color, you know, trans, trans of color activism, you know, is uh, really informing the organizing of this moment. And you see it very clearly, I think, in uh, the interpretations of, you know, inequalities around race, you know, around nation, um, around gender, around sexuality. Uh, so for me, this is a, a really important moment to see the intersections between scholarship and activism, especially around this work. And I'll hand it off. Susan, would you like to share some of your ideas with us? Sure. Um, I will uh, jump in to say first offer my my thanks uh, to my hosts and, and co panelists uh, to acknowledge that I'm speaking uh, today from the um, the ancestral lands of the Wayat people in, in Northern California. Um, and I put up on my um, for my my video sort of that backdrop an image from a beach near the place where I'm staying during my spring break. Um, um, we were asked to um, to address a few questions, and I tried to at least give little thumbnail uh, responses to each one of those that. Um, um, I was, we were asked to address genealogies and debates within queer and trans studies, role of CLAGs and fostering scholarship, new directions in queer and trans studies, uh, and might also want to jump off on or reflect on our Kessler lecture, which seems like a lot to do in eight minutes. So I'll just be very quick with that. Um, I, I wanna say that I thought my Kessler lecture, uh, which is called Ghost, dances was kind of a mess, um, uh, that I was trying out something new uh, uh, in public that I thought didn't quite come together. But in hindsight, I do see it foreshadowing uh, a turn in my work away from kind of a biopolitical focus to um, something that, um, you know, I would say is more in conversation with some of the sort of the ontological turn and and uh, the so-called new materialisms. So I will um, um, look forward to uh, saying a few more words about that in any published uh, work that comes out of this um, these sort of anniversary events. Uh, in terms of the influence of CLAGs on my own uh, work, it's like there, there were two CLAGS conferences in particular. I thought one on queer history in 1995 and one in uh, 2005, a, a decade later, that was a, a, a trans studies conference. Um, and so between that 1995 queer history conference and the 2005 trans studies conference, I, I really think of those as sort of bookends for a certain period in the development of trans studies. Um, and CLAGS was really important in articulating those, those moments. Um, I write about those conferences a little bit in Desubjugated Knowledges, which is the introduction to the first trans studies reader. So rather than rehash that, I'll just suggest that it's there for anybody who wants to, uh, to look at it. Um, regarding the histories and genealogies, you know, as I said, I've always been interested in, you know, these very sort of straightforwardly Foucauldian kinds of questions about biopolitics and like how sort of techniques and practices of individual sort of subjective individuation uh, relate to uh, categories for population management for state projects, um, you know, and, and in the kinds of cultural, social, political, and economic work that identity does, particularly um, historically novel and emergent forms of identities. So like, how is it that you can read emergent forms of identity and the kinds of communities they constellate as consequences or artifacts of some larger scale you know, socioeconomic political process. Um, and that, that that way of thinking really informs what, you know, I, I, I understand trans studies to have done, you know, from, from early on. Um, you know, it, the, the field often traces its roots to Sandy Stone's justly celebrated post-transsexual manifesto, which was published in 1991, uh, and to legacies of feminist science studies and feminist epistemology that were first um, 
that, that were in Stone's academic mentor Donna Haraway's work, um, particularly Cyborg Manifesto. Um, and that the term transgender became a name for Stone's post-transsexual politics the next year in 1992 with publication of Leslie Feinberg's pamphlet, Transgender Liberation, a movement whose time has come. Uh, but from the biopolitical perspective, I think it's really important to note that um, the, the widespread uptake and dissemination of the term transgender, um, which had been repurposed from marginalized subcultures of trans feminine people who had themselves repurposed it from sort of psychomedical discourse course, that this uptake of transgender took place in the context of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. You know, that I think of transgender as a name for a formation that addresses the new world order of global capital's irrational exuberance in the 1990s. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that transgender was a term popularized by a Marxist, Leslie Feinberg, you know, whose, whose last words were, I want to be remembered as a revolutionary communist, that it, that it circulated transnationally, primarily through global philanthropic work and NGOs addressing HIV AIDS, um, and that it was quickly and somewhat awkwardly assimilated into a neoliberal sort of diversity inclusion model. Um, you know, so that, that I, I really think of transgender as this uh, site for, um, for people who were trying to imagine a different world order, as well as something that was useful within the context of an actually emerging world order. You know, that, that transgender has always been a site of struggle, both a line of fight and a strategy for, um, for re-territorialism. Um, um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to um, questions about current uh, current issues. It's like I think the two most important things going on in trans studies right now is one the emergence of a trans of color critique that interrogates the unmarked as white origins of the field in the 1990s. We can have a, a lot to say about that, and the other question is um, about the sort of the the strange necessity of like once again needing to address um, an explicitly transphobic version of feminism, that um, a trans critique of transphobic feminism was actually part of the articulation of the field in Sandy Stone's work, referencing her own history of being targeted by certain varieties of, of, of transphobic feminism in the 1970s. Um, and that it is striking to me that this, um, you know, I often it's called the turf discourse, um, uh, is something that seemed to be on the wane for uh, several decades, and that in recent years it has um, it has just exploded with a newfound virulence, and that it has moved from being something that was fairly, I would say, contained in certain pockets of um, mostly lesbian separatist feminist discourse to something that is now totally um, enmeshed with a much broader uh, reactionary ethno populist. White, white supremacist movement. It's like that the discourse has moved from the margins to something that is very uh, central to some of the large political um, you know, questions we are all living within now. Um, I think in the interests of time, I'm gonna stop right there, just put a pin in those questions and um, maybe can talk more later about why I think trans continues to be a hot button topic in in the present but i'll stop now and pass the mic over to uh to jasbeer um hi, hi everyone it's good to see everyone um i'm honored to be here i want to thank clags for organizing this event um and thank all the tech folks um and also thanks to shaka and rod uh, and susan for being here thank you Justin uh, for the land acknowledgement and also Dave Anoush and Margot. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here in this company. And I also want to uh, congratulate CLAGS on its anniversary. It takes a lot of labor um, and creativity and ingenuity to keep this kind of thing going. 
Um, I was a board member of CLAGS in 1999 when I first moved um, to New York. So it's, it's really wonderful to continue to be um, involved with, uh, with CLAGS. Um, I, I don't know if I misunderstood the assignment or just did something different, um, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time in the spirit of um, queer then and now, uh, actually to talk about the farmers protests in India and hopefully make some links uh, both with uh, what Rod was talking about um, in terms of um, kind of uh, contemporary organizing and the intersections um, of all of these different issues of anti-capitalist um, and anti-neoliberal organizing that's going on in India. And also what um, Susan had just said about the kind of envisioning of new worlds, which I think is um, part of um, uh, kind of some of the aspirational parts of, of these protests. So, um, and, and of course these protests may at first glance seem to have actually no relationship to, um, to queerness or to transness. Um, these protests began in September last year uh, when a hundred, a th hundred thousands of um, tractors from villages in Punjab and neighboring states um, started moving and blocking um, transportation in the New Delhi region in that area. Um, and then there was a general strike in November of 250 million people countrywide. Um, these are protests uh, that are challenging um, three farm laws that the Indian government had decided to pass. Um, these protests have been called the largest uh, protests in all of human history. Um, and while these farm laws are about Indian agricultural labor writ large, there's also a kind of specific existentialist crisis uh, going on in Punjab that's animating these protests. It's been very long in the making. Um, there's been decades of, of land grab and um, liberalization and um, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, taking away of power uh, from laborers and from, from farmers in, in that region. Um, there's also been, uh, these protests have been called leftist protests, but they, they've also been called um, Sikh protests. And so that's the kind of intersection that I'm really um, interested in. There's been a kind of rethinking of um, Sikhism in this political organizing context. Um, and uh, one of the most interesting commentators um, about, uh, about these protests, Bikram Gill had, had said that um, nothing will ever be the same again. That's how, that's how large and expansive and how intense um, and how um, really pivotal um, these, these protests are. There's been a lauding, but also a repoliticization of, um, of Sikhi, which are, uh, refers to the tenets of Sikhism. Um, as fundamentally informing the organization and the conduct of the protesters. So it's a question then, is this a secular protest? It's not exactly a non-secular protest. Um, they, the protests have been dismissed um, as a kind of revival of the Khalistani separatist movement in the 70s and 80s. Um, so there's a lot of thin lines that are being navigated here. Um, uh, because the, the protesters are by and large, uh, largely um, from Punjab and predominantly Sikh, right? Um, so how and whether to protest a Sikh without being dismissed as a terrorist, um, how to respond to these forms of Indian state violence. There have been killings, disappearances, incarceration, sexual assault of female leaders of the protest without being stereotyped as warriors and how to resist the neoliberalism of the Indian nation state without being vilified as, as um, seditious or traitors. There's, and so the one aspect I wanna focus on here is there's been a lot of um, hailing uh, in Sikh forms about the praxis of, of longer at the protest, which is the, prax the praxis of communal cooking, feeding and eating. That's part of the broader philosophy of Sikhism. So from the advent of Sikhism, Lunger was envisioned as an anti-caste practice. And this includes the caste of women. So fundamentally against um, gender differentiation. Um, in practice, this commitment to these ideals vary um, and it doesn't mitigate the um, tensions in at the protests that caste differences are sutured 
through the land to the violence of this owner labor relationship and as, as well as to Sikh patriarchy. Um, a, a lot of these commentators have situated Langar as a form of conviviality that challenges caste, but its challenges to gender inequality have been far less commented upon. And that's you know, what I'm interested here. Um, but Langar is an important part of the sustainability of these protest spaces feeding not only thousands of protesters daily, but also feeding neighboring communities. Um, and so this speaks a little bit to what Susan was talking about, that Lunger isn't a form of mutual aid. It's a, it's a mode of envisioning um, more egalitarian, egalitarian forms of communalizing on, on a kind of affective, corporeal, um, ecological level. It's an institution, it's a theological philosophy, um, it's a conceptual space and, and obviously a daily praxis, it's, but it's also a horizon of becoming that's rooted in this kind of ongoing work of um, corporeal relationality. And you might have um, gotten notice or caught wind of the fact that there were um, Sikh Gudwaras, uh, you know, serving longer at Black Lives Matter protests last summer. Um, and that this is something that they've started doing um, whenever possible, actually. Um, so here, here we get to the queer, queer now part. So on Sikh Twitter, you know, which has been a, um, for months, a buzz with the kind of in real time updates on the farmers protests, there's been um, cast as harassment of queer and trans and Dalit Sikhs um, by uh, what are being called cis hetero Jat Sikhs. Um, these started last fall, they've intensified in February. And these otherwise progressive supporters of and the participants in these farmers protests are espousing this really vicious jet Sikh pride in part through this kind of queer phobic, transphobic, anti-caste vitriol. Um, in response, um, Manu and Manmeet, a non-binary Dalit and a trans Sikh um, respectively, penned a series of brilliant articles condemning the failure um, to realize the radical potential of Sikhi within the terms of Sikhi itself, writing that, quote, six annihilated caste, but this was not a passive proclamation, but an active disavowal of the caste system through instituting various measures like Lunger. And then they go on to remind the Sikh community that equality and liberation does not rest in mere statements or the lack thereof, but instead um, in an active commitment to dismantling casteist cis heteronormativity. So if you can see what I'm getting at is that there's no um, kind of anti-caste praxis without a kind of gender abolition and there's no gender abolition without a, without a kind of commitment to dismantling these hierarchies of um, capitalism and of class in, in these communities. So what I find so compelling about these interventions is that they're not actually professing longer to be a queer practice, um, but as a space of Sikhi that's already cohered through the multiplicities of gender and the banishing of caste. Um, queer, trans, and Dalit response to Hindu homonationalism is not based on a counter homonationalism, but on what already exists within the folds of Sikhi. So this isn't a demand so much for visibility of certain identities. Um, and it's not a politics of asking for inclusion. It's more so a kind of ethical theological orientation um, to these identities, right? Um, the radical force of queer and trans and Dalit Sikhs emanates from within, not from outside or externally to the congregation. In other words, there's no true Sikhi without queer and trans and Dalit Sikhs. Um, so this has been condemned as a blasphemous statement and yet the religious principles confirm it to be true. And finally, in the um, uh, in these series of interventions, Manu and Manmeet acknowledge the presence that's already there at these protests, um, the caste oppressed and the queer and trans farmers fighting within the protests right now, they're hailing the presence of, of them. So these anti-caste politics amongst these um, queer, trans, non-binary Dalit Sikhs, they're not especially wedded to the kind of elements of Sikh history that lend to archival reclamation. Um, for example, there's sometimes playful musings about whether or not the gurus were queer, um, but I'm reading their demands, not within a kind of past future or tradition, modern binary, but as a desire for a utopian radical Sikhi horizon. 
um, which would not be possible without achieving the dissolution of caste and gender differences. And in fact, um, as Manu and Manmi make clear in their missives, Langer cannot be truly practiced without challenging casteism, queerphobia, and transphobia, and without recognizing how these lives have been integral to the, the world-making institutions of Sikhi. So far from being distractions from these kind of anti-neoliberal, anti-capitalist, um, uh, kind of ideological thrusts of these farmers' protests, um, which is what some of us continue to be told. Um, this queer, trans, and Dalit vision of radical Sikhi is at the heart of this evolved resistance movement. And so that's the queer now part. I, you know, I think there'll be time to kind of elaborate a bit on the queer then part in in our um, conversation. But I wanted to draw attention to why, as queer and trans people, these protests are really important. Thank you so much, Jasbir. Well, well, well. Um, so my job is to ask questions. And yet everything that each of you said um, raises yet more questions. So I'm gonna stick to, in general form, the questions that um, we discussed a little bit beforehand, but maybe there'll be some ways to, to tweak them to thread together some of what I think each of you are, are saying, or, or that there's some part of what it is that you're each up to in different ways. So the first question um, is really a question about um, the transnational circulation of, um, of queer studies, of queer of color critique. Where are these texts meeting people and circulating and how in turn are those contacts informing in turn what it is we do in the you know, largely Anglo-European academy? And you might even think about it, I mean, something very, you know, quotidian maybe is like, have you ever been in another country and someone said your work did a thing for me at a time? And how did that inform where you went in your thinking and writing from there? Um, I think it might make sense for me to just throw this out there, but I just had um, a kind of conversation with Rahul Rao, whose new book is called Out of Time. And um, it actually looks at the circulation of homonationalism as a term and as a, a kind of accusation. Um, and this has been, um, when, when, when Rahul launched, launched his book um, about a year ago on a virtual launch, he said, you know, now that we understand homonationalism, we've overcorrected for it. And this, this kind, of, um, kind of cleared up this huge fog of anxiety that I've been having about the circuits, the circuitry and the, and the transit of homonationalism as um, moving precisely through the kind of homo capitalist is what he calls it circuits of empire of settler colonialism of multiculturalism and of academic um you know institutional privilege moving through those very um circuits that that homo nationalism was was meant to um to critique and to to somehow undermine so i've always felt that there's been a really i've always had a very complicated relationship to um, the way homo nationalism has been taken up as a kind of soundbite in other locations when in actuality it's really um, wedded to a US context, particularly the you know, uh, post 9-11 context and particularly Islamophobia. Um, Rahul's uh, book argues for um, a kind of counter notion uh, called homo capitalism and he develops this idea of homo capitalism from his work in Uganda and his, his work in India um, and really looks at how the civilizational um, disciplining of homo nationalism is kind of superseded by the lure of a kind of capitalist integration of queer subjects, um, whether it's through international, uh, the, the International Monetary Fund or um, NGOs or other kinds of government entities, um, uh, 
in, international financial instruments, I guess are called IFIs. And so he really looks at the ways it's it's the way he explains it as a kind of thinking through of Partha Chatterjee's work, um, you know, where the the spiritual is the kind of domestic um, and gendered uh, female gendered space, and the the world is um, the kind of and and that's the space that holds down the kind of cultural narratives at stake. Um, and then the the world is um, where the outside of the of the public space is understood as worldly um, and mobile. Um, and and so homo capitalism kind of works through this this bifurcation of um, the holding on to certain kinds of cultural norms and not submitting to homo nationalism as an accusation, um, but then uh, fostering queer subjects, uh, queer um, LGBTQ organizing. Um, so hit one of his main points is that a lot of LGBTQ organizing in Global South locations have proliferated and flourished precisely because of access to neoliberal capital. And so he's trying to think about, you know, what that relationship is. So that's just one example, um, I think, of, um, you know, having to, for me, myself, having to backtrack and ask questions about why homonationalism has been taken up um, in so many other places and, and whether homonationalism itself has then allowed for or has made way for um, uh, a kind of uh, moving past an anti-capitalist uh, critique in queer studies in some ways. That's just a concern of mine. All right, maybe I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think I have a similar relationship to the circulation, you know, of my work as Jazz Beers and that I decided you know, um, right after Aberrations was published that I would be the witness, you know, to my work, that I wouldn't try to kind of control its circulation. Um, and for me, it's a way of, you know, kind of exercising, you know, this point that, you know, actually Nietzsche makes in the preface to On the Genealogy of Morals, where he says the, um, the writer is the precondition of the text, but the reader is really its condition. And so, as witness to um, my work circulation, it's been a way for me to see what other people do with the arguments, with the frameworks, with the categories, and not to be the one to say, no, this is right, this is not, you know, but to see um, how the categories are remade and refashioned, you know, to speak to the particular urgencies and whatever locale that we're talking about. And when I've been in those places, you know, outside of this country, it's, um, you know, trying to adopt the position of the listener, right? Um, and also listen to what people are doing with the work, what they're wrestling with, but also, um, you know, trying to use that encounter to revise my own citational practices you know, so that um, I take and learn from the folks that I'm talking to, so that I revise, you know, um, my citational practices in the classroom, you know, in my scholarship, uh, in terms of the text, in terms of the authors, in terms of the organizers. Um, because if you remember, um, the critiques that women of color feminists, you know, were making of Anglo-American feminists, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, you know, uh, the critique of, you know, our work is not impacting the way feminism is done, you know, that is a way of noting how, you know, certain forms of hegemony, you know, uh, are, you know, really established through how and who we citate or who we, uh, you know, uh, cite. And so, you know, for me, that encounter, you know, with my work, but also with people who are using the work in other uh, settings is not a moment for me to um, engage in a kind of ego congratulation, but a really a moment to, open myself to a reinvention.
Okay, well, I, I guess I should jump in now. Um, apologies for I, I lost my internet connection while Jasbir was was speaking and it took me a while to get back in. But um, um, thinking about the transnational circulation of some of the work that I've done, I, I'll just say that um, th that I often see a, a, a real disconnect between what happens in trans studies in the academy in the US and what people seem hungry for elsewhere that um, you know that I, I'm I'm often asked to when I when I speak, in other countries, it's like I'm 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 often asked to speak on two particular topics, and that one of them is that in whatever country I'm speaking in, there is work going on. You know that for me, it's like it's the biopolitical question of gender. It's kind of like that. There's something that the state is trying to do, or that activists are trying to do within the state to like make lives more livable for trans people through the provision of either um, uh, you know, changes in policy, um, uh, access to healthcare, um, uh, provision of social services, that there's something that's very tangible that they want me to come in and be the person from the US with a certain kind of um, you know, cu cultural capital that they can mobilize in relationship to some local campaign and that you know, while I think that work is really vital in terms of saving people's lives, um, it is often not for me the most intellectually interesting. It feels it feels necessary without going. Okay, like I get it. I understand why it's why it's important. The other thing that happens is that, and this has increasingly been the case over the last few years, is that. Contact local. There's something that happened, um, really energized a uh, transphobic feminist group and alliance with like right wing, uh, you know, evangelical groups or other you know right wing ethno populist groups, and I get called in to, um, you know, to be the trans person that other people can be in solidarity with to push back against this really pernicious framing of trans issues. And, and I'll to, to maybe try to uh, link that to um, uh, some of the things I had thought about saying, but, but hadn't said in my earlier remarks um, about kind of the direction I was trying to go with my Kessler lecture back in, in 2008 was increasingly feeling like, um, you know, intellectually I understood trans issues through this biopolitical framework, but that it wasn't enough. It's like that, the, the, that what was at stake in trans lives was not winning an argument because you had a good analysis of something, that it was intellectually grounded, that you could use evidence, that you could use data, and that you could rationally persuade someone uh, of the rightness of your position because, because trans issues were increasingly caught up in you know, what I called imaginary warfare. It's like it was rooted in an imaginary, you know, a nationalist and ethnic kind of nat nationalism that the trans figure becomes a kind of, um, you know, like the, this, this phantasm uh, and that what is needed is not a better argument, but a kind of mobilization in a different register of um, kind of the, the power that gets invested in in transness it's like the 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 positioning of it is something demonic or um irrational or um just something you know threatening and and disruptive that needs to be um eliminated as, as a threat and so like how is it that you can take so the power invested in transness and use it to sort of undo the very terms on which the debate about transness has been constituted. You know, that it's, um, that it is something that's like more mythopoetic or metaphysical or even theological or religious. I mean, that it's something that is about, um, 
moving in the immaterial and about narrating it differently and finding some kind of ritual that helps invoke and materialize the um, um, what is needed, you know, so that that life can persist or else if not persisting mark in a kind of mournful way, the passing of something that is being lost. So, so um, you know, I, I if if I think of where I'm interested in trying to take my work in trans studies, it's much more in the less in the direction of reasoned analysis and much more in the direction of a kind of public storytelling that helps um, in, invoke, you know, and evoke um, the kind of world that we want to live in that unbinds the way certain energies have been bound to create the potential for something new to emerge. All right, thank you so much, um, Susan, and thank you to all of you. I'm gonna just do a little feel here for what was just said, just and riff for like a minute or two. Um, we'll see what happens. So I was struck by the stories of eating together, being fed together, breaking down certain kinds of boundaries, um, storying together, as Susan was just saying. Roderick, I was thinking about your piece, um, uh, Sissy's at a Picnic, um, and I was thinking too about how this question about the transnational circulation of work or your work and the encounters that they've um, produced, there's a longing to connect. You made connections. The, the work affected people. You know, Susan, you were describing, you know, it's like you're help in a way you're helping to save lives in these contexts. That's an extraordinary um, that's the sort of extraordinary evidence that queer worlds are, are being built transnationally, right? That they are, that there is a conversation. Now, whether that, you know, can decenter the hegemony of the US Academy and the production of queer studies, you know, we can, we can hope so, but like, but that there's a longing in that I think people get something that they desperately need, but also, you know, um, one, one also receives things that maybe one didn't know that one needs, right? I also heard a lot of interesting words come up again in different ways, each of you. Um, ethics, foster, theological came up more than once. Interesting word to hear necessarily in this, in this space for different kinds of reasons. Um, and yeah, and then this just is the politics of eating together, right? The politics of eating together and the longing that we have to do so and to, to story together. So I do wanna ask kind of one super tiny follow-up question. And hopefully we have time. Someone will shout at me in the chat if we don't, which is um, this talking about this transnational circulation of a feminist and queer texts. Um, what feminism are transphobic feminists reading? I've been very interested in this question lately and not to sort of stir the pot. It doesn't have to be a long answer, but just this, this question, I'm like, which, and I understand these these this, these strains of feminism, as Susan was saying, you know, come from the 1970s. But what are they reading? And then, what are they reading? What feminism? Um, you know, I mean, I I, I think the t the texts that kind of keep getting sort of it's Mary Daly, you know, back to theology, gyne ecology. Um, it's Janice Raymond, it's Robin Morgan, um, you know, it, increasingly it's Sheila Jeffries, but, but th th these are just places where I would say the, the meme or the discourse originated. You can trace it back to certain texts, but I think that it circulates now in a way that's not historically grounded. It's not like, you know, there are the scholars of a certain, you know, strain of feminist thought. I think it's trans scholars who actually have done more of that genealogical work, um, you know that. But that that what circulates now through certain you know bad versions of of feminism, you know, it's kind of like the you know the phantasmatic figure of the Jew in a you know anti fantasies. You know, as I even though I disagree with Zizek about a lot of things, I think 
his reading of the phantasm, the, the anti-Semitic phantasm of the Jew. It's just like, it's the same fantasy structure that transphobic feminism, which is why I think it dovetails so effortlessly with some of the, you know, the, the, the resurgence in ethno-nationalist right-wing authoritarian populism, that it is essentially a fantasy about which body is as imagined as an, an, an internal threat to the integrity of the, the nation's borders and boundaries, who should be a member of the body politic and who needs to be expelled as a foreigner, you know, and that the trans figure is, you know, a very uncanny figure because it's not necessarily imagined as someone who has come into the nation from the outside, but it's like it's the threat within the nation of um, its own potential for, for disruption and, and undoing and for falling apart. Thank you. And just um, if after when the speakers have finished speaking, if you can just make sure you turn off your mic. Um, Roderick, Jasbir, did you want to do the get that question or do you want to move on to the next one? I feel like we just, you know, got perfectly well schooled in in that. So let's move actually. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, let's move to the second question, which is really a chance to just glow up, that was the sort of prompt. We just wanna hear who you're reading, who you're excited to be reading. Um, glow up the young scholars, um, you know, throw shine on the ideas that people in, the, in attendance might not have learned about yet. So this is just, tell us, tell us what you're reading. Who's gonna start? Okay, I tend to shy away from these kind of questions because I always leave somebody out. Um, but, you know, the I will make a plug for um, uh, my colleague Evan Softsey's new book. Um, plug, plug, plug away. Yeah, that Clubhouse, just came plug out, away. you know, about the intersections of uh, discourses around sexuality, uh, uh, civic nationalism in Turkey and neoliberalism. All right, so I'll make a plug for that uh, book. I think what excites me in general are the folks who are running with, um, you know, the work that was started, you know, early in the 2000s, you know, that we all were a part of, you know, and the questions around the, um, material dimensions, you know, whether they, the political economic questions, uh, the questions as Jasmir was mentioning around activism, the questions around, um, you know, variegating the genealogies of these categories, whether we're talking about queerness or transness, you know, that Susan was mentioning in terms of trans of color, uh, critical work that's emerging. Um, so everybody who's doing that work, I want to lift up. <laughs> Thank you. I think people will drop those books into the chat. So excited. Um, thanks for thanks for mentioning Evren's book. I really it, it's really an incredible book. So I'll I'll double glow that up. Um, I guess I had I I just had a I was reading Rod's book last week. We demand, which is also another book that everyone should read. Um, but I guess I, I, you know, and this, this goes to um, something that Aaron Izura said in um, a round table that's on trans, um, trans thinking that's published in the left of queer issue that David Eng and I did, where he said, you know, a lot of the really amazing trans uh, study scholars are um, precariously employed. Uh, they don't have tenure or um, tenure track jobs and they're moving from like postdoc to adjunct labor to et cetera. And so I, I guess even before I think about, you know, field formation, I'm just wondering about the, um, the material conditions of, of possibility in the academy writ large right now, which I think is conditioning everything we're talking about, including circulation, including, um, you know, what we're assigning and who, who we're reading. Um, you know, Matthew Brim's book 
I think is something we all have to contend with, poor queer studies, um, you know, where he's really marking the kind of um, uneven institutional privileges that we have or don't have and how that actually conditions and speaks to um, a lot of what's what's being circulated. And Rod, your, you know, your book was was so incredible in terms of thinking about the university um, in crisis um, and, uh, you know, as a place of, um, of protest and dissent, but also, um, you know, as, as um, a place where, of, of ex exploited labor, right? Um, that we have to situate the university as a, as a place of exploitation of workers. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I have a number of, of people also that I'm really excited to, to um, kind of plug, but I also just wanted to bring up, and, and the other thing I was thinking about Rod, and you might know the question, you might know the answer to this more so than I do, but the way, you know, that queer studies the last 30 years of institutionalization of queer studies has been largely through um, a relatively, you know, okay job market, or there's been relative jobs compared to what's going on now. Um, so, you know, that also um, makes me think about this kind of uneven institutional access. And then Susan, you've done so much work to, um, to kind of solidly institutionalize uh, transgender studies, um, both through TSQ um, and also through the way that you um, kind of organized institutional resources around jobs and positions, et cetera. So, so that's, that's my counter question about um, what do we do about the university? Um, what do we do about the conditions of knowledge production that, are, that we're facing right now? Yeah, if I can answer that, I think, you know, Chesra, you're absolutely right, you know, because it also is the question of, you know, how do we radically democratize the conditions of those, of that production, right? Especially given that, um, you know, there will be a lot of losses on the market, you know, um, and how not to turn that into the further diminishment of lives and also the loss of intellectual production. You know, so where are the other sites within and outside the university that we could encourage and build, you know, that will be as vital and sometimes more vital than universities in the production of critical knowledges. Yeah, so um, uh, to, to, to piggyback on those, those comments, it's like, yeah, I, I feel like I had some opportunities to quote unquote institutionalize trans studies in a certain way over the past decade. And most of those ways have, um, I think, shut down or fallen apart, um, you know, around problems of the neoliberal university as well as, you know, COVID. Um, in a recent issue of TSQ from last year, it was called uh, trans studies now, you know, I kind of give a postmortem on uh, what I felt like happened and has happened at um, University of Arizona and that particular version of trying to institutionalize trans studies. Um, um, you know, I, I, you know, the, the, the COVID crisis, it's like, it's, it's devastating. It's like, I feel like we're in a storm where we're only now starting to um, kind of poke, poke our heads out and see what the damage has been. But that I also feel like I'm kind of amazed at what's been happening over Zoom. It's like we need to figure out how to, how to, um, to, to I don't, I hate to use the word capitalize, but it's like, how do we like take advantage of what's um, been happening on Zoom? It's like, I've gone to events like Rod, you came to Mills College Trans studies speaker events, we've been getting like 900 people coming to those things, just at these event live, right? So like, how, how can we, how can we think about using the university that's left up to like conversation and discussion and networking in these Para institutional faces. Like I'm really interested in putting my energy um, into um, 
uh, re really thinking about how to work as a para academic again in some new some new way. Um, and then just in the sh shameless, um, you know, um, you know, to, to make some sh shameless plugs. It's like first of all, it's like let me just like triple team on Evren Savchi. I'll be speaking with her on on Sunday at another event. Really looking forward to that. Um, but uh, there's a new series coming out at, at Duke uh, called Asterisk um, that's co-edited by um, Eliza Steinbach, um, Jen Neo Chen, and, and me it's called Asterisk colon gender, gender comma trans hyphen and all that comes after, which is a way of like trying to think about methodologies or aesthetics that have come out of trans studies and how gender never happens, you know, in a vacuum. It's always in relationship to other things that are being transed. Uh, and so like, how do we think transgender in relationship to the transnational or the transgenic or trans species or, you know, other categories that are, um, you know, categories of race, of ability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the first uh, three books that will be coming out in that series, um, uh, the first one will be Misha Cardenas's book on a trans of color poetics. Um, then there will be books by Marquise Bay and then Cameron Awkward Rich. It's like, I think these are some of the most, ex some of the most exciting work that's happening in trans studies right now. And we have got a long list of, you know, 15 or 20 books that are somewhere in the pipeline. It's a really, um, um, you know, so somewhere between almost ready and bright idea that we are trying to cultivate, but it's just a, you know, it's, um, in spite of the precarity of academic employment right now, there is a huge body of work that I feel like is just on the on the horizon and is coming into being right now. So keep your eyes peeled for work in that series. Yeah, the um, university is refuge and and everything else, you know, all the violence that comes with this refuge. It's amazing that you're able to do this, Susan. Just Fantastic. Congratulations. Rod, I know you had your hand up earlier and Jasbury, you're about to speak as well. Um, well, I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, along uh, continue this um, uh, plugging of works. Jan's book, just uh, Trans Exploits, just won an award um, uh, from the Association of American Studies. So uh, that's so it's, it's a really fantastic book. But also, um, I just finished reading uh, Marquise Bay's um, Anarcho Blackness, which I just thought was really incredible. Um, and so I, I too am really excited about, um, I think Rod mentioned this, but the, the work on, um, on trans and particularly black trans reproductive labor. Um, so Trevor Ellison, um, you know, waiting always excitedly for, for Trevor's work. Um, Cam Awkward Rich as well. And the other thing I wanted to mention is just the Global South Trans Studies that's really um, coming into being right now. And I, so I was putting together, I have to, I'm teaching transnational sexualities this fall. So I'm slowly putting together that syllabus, but um, you know, half the syllabus is from TSQ. I think TSQ has just done, you've done a fantastic job um, kind of decentering US, um, you know, uh, US, US knowledge production ideas as well as US based scholars as well. So, um, so that's, so, you know, that's, that's the global South um, uh, trans studies um, is really exciting to me. And again, this kind of work on, on caste um, and gender, which I think is going to become increasingly more important and also um, increasingly relevant to organizing and activist spaces as well. Um, as we start untangling um, the kind of uh, complexities of racial formation in other places. Um, Rod, I, if you'd like to respond, it is a, we have about 15 minutes for audience Q&A. Um, so please feel to jump in and then we'll, and then we'll ask a couple sure, of sure. from the- Sure, um, I'll just add also uh, Gassama Sawi's uh, disruptive situations. Uh, fractal Orientalism and Queer Strategies in Beirut. Um, the, but the question I had, um, and you know, we don't have to 
take this question, we can go to the audience, but was to revisit um, something that Susan Jasbeer brought up in terms of the question of institutionalization, you know, uh, in terms of the institutionalization of uh, homo nationalism on one hand uh, and uh, of trans studies and transness on the other hand with Susan and what their observations are for how to um, produce alternative institutions or institutional uh, practices. But, you know, I just, we can also go to the audience. <laughs> Well, I think this question of institution building is an important one and it, and it should continue, you know. Um, I, I think it's important to let the, some of the people here who've come and ask such beautiful, colorful questions also um, go. So unless Jasbir, Susan, um, strong feelings, ask some audience questions. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, guess I just wanted to add to this thing of institutionalization is, um, um, you know, to just to just flag how many um, grad students are striking or getting ready to strike, um, how many labor issues we're dealing with right now. The Rutgers Union is uh, one of one of the strongest unions in the country and is fighting for grad student funding extensions. Um, so, you know, to think of the think of the university as a as a not just a place where we produce counter carceral knowledge, but we're kind of actively resisting the kind of carceral, um, you know, assemblage that Rod so beautifully lays out and we demand, right? That's been normalized in some ways, um, you know, since the 1970s, um, as you know, when Rod, Rod points out the, the random campus um, security becomes campus police, right? Um, the cops off campus movement that's starting to organize nationally. Um, all of, I think all of these, um, you know, students for justice in Palestine, uh, the growth of, of SJP has been phenomenal as a faculty um, advisor for a couple of years. Um, that work has been so important and that work is something that um, so many uh, entities are trying to shut down. So I think it's, it's, you know, we have to keep thinking about the ways in which we can keep these institutional spaces, um, ones where um, the question of who's doing what work um, is always at play or is always being highlighted. Thank you so much. So there were fantastic questions and I don't think we'll get to um, maybe hear the answer to many. So I did want to focus on one to begin with um, it's from an Aboriginal trans professor in what is now known as in Australia. And I'm going to some like kind of make it a little bit shorter, not to whatever. The, there are politics in that, but I have to be able to make it uh, a little simple, simpler. Um, we do we do land acknowledgements. We some of some of us do land acknowledgements sometimes, but there hasn't or doesn't seem to have been much conversation in, in this conversation in this meeting about First Nations uh, communities um, and their part in, in their part in trans and queer um, history and especially in sort of the ways in which that also articulates with anti-colonial um, um, efforts. Uh, so thank you to Prof. Sandy O'Sullivan for that really good question. You want us to respond, Shaka? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if, you know, these things are really weird into the audience. <laughs> um, and we haven't figured everything out yet, but I've been spending a lot of time on Clubhouse. And there's, I'm now using Clubhouse in this way where there's like a pause, like a podcast pause, and then the next person just sort of intuitively knows. But uh, I was no. waiting for your Amy Goodman response. Or your response. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, you know, certainly the work on settler colonialism and its intersections with um, queerness and transness is of absolute importance. Um, that we didn't mention it should not be taken as a sign that you know it is not regarded and also not 
an important emergence, you know, within these fields. Um, you know, I mean, you know, for instance, one of the uh, really inspiring uh, aspects of this moment, I think, are the ways in which, you know, our undergraduate students and also our graduate students, but also our undergraduates are, you know, insisting, um, indigenous and non-indigenous students insisting on, you know, a reckoning with separate colonialism within, you know, our various, um, you know, critical locations and, you know, that work should be lifted up and should be encouraged as well. Um, if I could just go ahead and make another little plug here in that same issue of TSQ called Trans Studies Now, there's um, uh, an article by, by um, Maddie Day, who's a, a post-grad student in the country now called Australia, writing on um, uh, indigenous queer and trans studies in Australia uh, that I found really uh, useful for like thinking about um, how trans studies can tra trace different genealogies to different roots other than like the Western biomedical uh, com complex. Um, and uh, just to second what, what it is that, that Rod was saying, it's like the, the idea of gender as part of the biopolitical apparatus of settlement of like taking populations and turning them into something else through the operations of settler colonialism is like is like an the absolutely like fundamental and in some ways like maybe most fundamental aspect of of gender it's like you know maria lagona lagona taught us you know long ago to think about the coloniality of gender and uh you know i you're right it's like we did not uh, address that dimension uh, a lot in our remarks today but uh I do say I'm really uh, in, inspired by work that some of my, my students are doing on re rethinking the relationship between Western and Eurocentric notions of transgender and um, indigenous and two-spirit traditions in North America in particular. It's like it's, it is part of the next generation of work that I am seeing coming along that I am very excited to, uh, to see. Thank you so much. Um... I think we definitely have time for another answer, uh, another question. And again, there, the questions in the that have been submitted are just kind of really good. Um, so I do feel um, so. One maybe speaks. Uh, Mahmoud asks. Mahmoud Khan asks. What are the most potentially promising, seeming para academic sites for precar precarious scholars at the moment? So I think that extends then the opportunity to discuss. You know, these questions of institution building. So where are, so they already exist, right? There are already ones, it, they have to be, like people came before us, right? We have some, we have some elders. I mean, I guess I, I wanted to um, maybe not go to the, the elders question, but um, I mean, to talk a little, to, to reflect a little bit on what Susan was talking about, about um, the way that these Zoom events have created a kind of transnational or more global lexicon for certain kinds of conversations because we can talk to people, um, people can talk to to people that they otherwise normally wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, be talking to. And so I think that's um, I'm not I'm not you know Zoom has other issues, um, which is you know they they've shut down a couple events on Palestine now um, because of pressure from. Um, people complaining about certain events. So we have to be um, kind of careful about Zoom in that way because we need alternative platforms. But just the kind of para-academic spaces of these, um, of these virtual events, I think should continue in some way. They also um, enable important, um, you know, access um, on all sorts of levels, you know. So this is, you know, you can kind of see where, um, you know, accommodations are actually really easy to implement, um, and you know, it, it and people and and you know, people with disabilities have been asking for them, but they you know they they've only really kind of been sutured into the way we do our work through um, COVID. So that's something to take note of as well. But I was also just thinking of Clubhouse, you know, like um, you know the kind of spaces that are being created. On, and I again, I don't want to 
you know, minimize the forms of surveillance as well as um, the monetization of all of this. Um, but, you know, what kinds of alternative spaces are people building? A lot of it is, seems to be virtual. Thank you. Susan or Rod, did you want to add anything else? I mean, I would just say that, um, you know, one way of, you know, invoking, you know, our queer and trans ancestors would be to build more of those spaces, you know, um, to sort of, you know, actively see the constitution of alternative um, spaces and institutional formations as completely in line with what people were doing uh, 69 and onward, you know? And so that should actually become part of our uh, queer and trans social practice. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you all again so much. I've learned so much from you over the years and um, and I know that people are here because you have, something has happened in an encounter before. And I think that fostering these spaces in the ways that we want them to be fostered, I think you're right, Jasper, this is one of the ways that we can build these connections, however imperfect, and as well as all of the you know, face-to-face -face organizing, um, all the forms of mutual aid that people have so beautifully demonstrated over this last year and that we can continue to provide for one another. Um, so thank you again to all of you. And I think Debanush is gonna take it from here. Um, audience, I don't know if you can clap, but you should clap. Thank you, Shaka. <laughs> Thank you to all of the speakers. Devanuj actually went to sleep because they're in, <laughs> I think it's very late hour for them. And so they had to say good night, but I wanted to um, thank everyone for their contribution. Thank you Shaka for moderating and Susan and Roderick and Jasper for giving us so much of your time and your scholarship and continuing to move us forward in your work. It's a tremendous honor to participate with you and in to be in conversation with you. Um, and I, we're, we're gonna close this out, but before people head out, we wanted to give um, a small update. I'm gonna invite uh, one of our uh, board members, Joseph Donica, to jump on and say hello. And I should say that I'm Sean Smith-Cruz, one of the co-chairs alongside Deb Anoush who gets to participate in all of this amazing CLAGS programming. Joseph, are you still around too? Yes, I'm still around. Hi. <clears throat> I can't believe that picture's up there. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, I'm Joseph Donago, a board member. Also, I teach at Bronx Community College. Um, I'm here. Yes. So do we have an update? <clears throat> oh, I thought you had the update. We were going to do a drum roll update for all of the donations that came in during this talk because we know that people were uh, anxiously and excitedly supporting the work of CLAGS. While we wait. As we of 556, we had $250, but that was a bit ago. So uh, we're at 300. Awesome. Thank you to everybody who's donated. Keep them coming. We uh, really love and depend on the support of the community. And I wanted to make sure that we, um, followed you to our some of our next events that are coming up we actually have um, a repository so in the name of continuing queer scholarship we have a repository that is being pushed through the cuny graduate center and some of the people who are in the call who are here today and who are uh, some of the speakers are part of this repository where the scholarship that has some of the work that has never been seen from the clags archive is now currently available open access through the CUNY Academic Works Repository. So we're going to unveil that next Thursday on April 1st. I can't believe it's already April. So at 2 p.m. we want people to join in and 
uh, pay, just tune into the work of the, oh, it's, uh -oh, it's showing me where it is. So you can, the link should come up in the chat. I do have a quick overview. Here's what the CUNY Academic Works repository looks like. And we already have over 100 uh, imports into the repository. So I saw like Benjamin is here. We have some stuff from some of the panelists. Uh, Susan Stryker is in here. And so you can really get to download work. Jess Beer is also in here. There's definitely a lot of work that may be available to your teaching. There's Susan's right there. So you could download these and the authors receive um, acknowledgement and contribution reports. So it's really, um, I think a testament to queer scholarship that we are able to pull from 1992, I think is the earliest one. Um, in this repository, we're continuing to upload. So we will be unveiling that next Thursday. And I hope that people can tune in just to hear about the process. We're gonna hear from a few of CLAG's board members and previous directors on the process of getting all of the scholarship downloadable, publicly accessible in an international scope. And then after that, we're also gonna have the following week on Wednesday, April 7th, we're gonna have some black lesbians come at you to unveil the book, uh, Mounds of Rain, which just released from New Press um, in February. And so we're gonna hear from some past Kessler uh, winner, Cheryl Clark, also Joel Gomez. We're gonna get information from the Salsa Soul Sister, um, one of the co-founding board members, as well as the editor of the book, Brianna Simone Jones. We're gonna have a really fun, intergenerational interactive um, event for you. And so we hope that you will the link, check the link in the chat to register for that as well. And I think that that is all that I have to conclude um, our programming. I do want everybody who was here to turn on their cameras and say a final um, thank you and congratulation to everyone who participated and who came. And just you know, say good night. And if you wanted to add any final words, or folks in the chat want to acknowledge their their attendance as well, and say uh, congratulations to this this wonderful event. Thank you to all the Kessler winners. Thank you, guys. It was great to be in conversation. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it was a really, really fun. Thanks. Thanks for uh, for having for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. This was really great. I always feel so. Um, so heartened and energized by these kinds of gatherings. So yeah, thanks Shaka also, questions. Thank you, Shaka. All right, I gotta play with my cat because that whole time we were in this meeting, he was like, up in my business. Guys, it was so fantastic. I hope to see you in person soon. All right, be safe. Thank you. Well, Bye. Bye.